month. The speaker will be on February 27th. Penny Blue, and for those of you who don't know Ms. Blue, she wrote a book honoring or memoirs with her father, <clears throat> and it's called A Time to Protest, Leadership Lessons from My Father Who Survived the Segregated South for 99 Years. And he grew up in uh, it's Franklin County, uh, the Sontag area, over towards Rocky Mount. So she's going to be here uh, to help us um, honor Black History Month. So I just spoke to her today, in fact. And so, uh, yes, Kelly, she will be sending you some promotional materials on that. So um, on with tonight's speaker. We're very excited to present tonight's speaker, Mr. Nelson Harris. Being a regular member of our historical society, you might say Nelson needs no introduction to this crowd. He is our past president of the historical society and a regular speaker over the years to the Kegley Lecture Series. He is past mayor of Roanoke. He is a longtime pastor of the Heights Church just down the street from here. He's also a graduate of Patrick Henry High School. We were talking about that earlier, class of 82. I'm 79, and John Long is 85. So, I don't know, we never ran into each other, but just, here we are. Um, so he is the author, uh, excuse me, he is also a committed historian documenting the life and times of our Roanoke region. He is the author of 13 books on Roanoke area history. He writes a regular column about history for the Roanoker magazine. He is also the producer, writer, and host of Eye on the Past on Blue Ridge Public Television. You may find Nelson on most days working on a handful of projects, including his next book, or a local historical marker installation, or a series of comments that he's been asked to make in a special ceremony. Nelson is a volunteer and contributor to our society's annual journal, and he is here tonight to share with us the book he launched just before the pandemic isolation period. Wendy and I saw him present this new book at the Harrison Museum right before everything shut down. And I believe he was scheduled to speak here in the next month or two. So it is our great pleasure to bring him here tonight for a long overdue lecture on the Roanoke Valley in the 1940s. Please help me welcome Mr. Nelson here. Thank you, Stephen. I appreciate that. And yeah, the book came out, and uh, we had all these like little book launch events planned, and uh, lectures, and so on and so forth. And I did one, and then did no more, like for six or eight months. So um, I do want to say a little something about the book uh, itself. Um, why the 1940s? Well, you know, kind of the go-to reference is Raymond Barnes's book, A History of the City of Roanoke, and if if you have that, and most of you I'm sure probably do, it ends in 1940. And so uh, I approached uh, the library and said we, we really need to have a, a comprehensive history picking up from that point and then moving, you know, moving forward. Um, Raymond Barnes's book, as you know, starts in the, in the you know, late, uh, in the early 1880s, and, and, and so each year is kind of a uh, a, a small chapter, and I decided to do it different and do uh, decade by decade. So, uh, this was the, the product, the Roanoke Mountain 1940, it's about 600 and some pages, and it's got 300 archival images in it. So, um, so I did bring some, uh, we are selling them for $40. They retail actually for $75, so here's what you can do. You can buy like two or three for $40 and resell them for $75. And you've made some money tonight. You have made some money tonight. But uh, no, I, uh, when Stephen called and asked if I would come do this, I, of course I was delighted. And uh, I said, well, I, I, I'll bring books with me and, and we'll sell uh, some hopefully. And then whatever sells, 100% of the proceeds go to our historical society. So you get a good book and you'll make a contribution as well to the to the society. Well, what I want to do is uh, uh, share a little bit about uh, the 1940s uh, in the Roanoke Valley, and then what I find most people find most interesting are the old photographs. And so, uh, so we'll go through uh, about 60 of those, and I'll comment a, a little bit along the along the way. Well, in uh, in Roanoke. Just for fun, 
the uh, entertainers that came through uh, was really kind of a, a just top tier gold standard of, of entertainers. And of course, at, at this point in time, Roanoke was the third largest city in the, in the Commonwealth. So uh, we were on everybody's radar screen. Uh, but the entertainers that came through, some of them, and I'll share them, Roy Acuff, Louis Armstrong, Eddie Arnold, Gene Autry, Count Basie. Uh, a 27-year-old Leonard Bernstein came with the Pittsburgh Symphony. Uh, Victor Borg. The lights went out in the Academy of Music during uh, his performance. And of course, in true Victor Borg fashion, uh, he, he took a cigarette lighter and lit it and looked at it at the audience and said, Oh, there you are. <laughs> Cab Calloway, Nat King Cole, Tommy Dorsey, Ella Fitzgerald, Dizzy Gillespie, Benny Goodman, Lionel Hampton, Woody Herman. Billy Holiday, The Ink Spots, Harry James, Guy Lombardo, Glenn Miller, uh, Bill Monroe, The Nicholas Brothers, which were, they were uh, dancers, um, Bill Bojangles Robinson, Roy Rogers, Artie Shaw, Sister Rosetta Tharp, um, Fats Waller, and the person that came the most, because it's index, so all I had to do was look at the index and see who had, who had the most, most page references, was a grand old Opry star, uh, Minnie Perk. So, so out of all the groups, she was the one that came the most, uh, the most times. In sports, uh, the Boston Red Sox and the Cincinnati Reds came on a fairly regular basis to do exhibition games. Jack Dempsey came, the Detroit Lions and the Pittsburgh Steelers uh, did an exhibition football game. Joe Lewis, uh, Byron Nelson and Sam Snead came and did a uh, match play at a, at a local golf course. Jesse Owens made three appearances uh, in the Roto period during the 1940s. Uh, he, and this is kind of, this is really kind of a little bit of a sad commentary on the times, not on Roto, but just on the times in general. If you were a gold medalist Olympian today, you know, you do a cereal box cover, you do some ads, and you're a multimillionaire overnight and set for life. If you were Jesse Owens in the 1940s, you had to do the circuit where you raced horses to make a living. And so he would come and, uh, and do that, and he was uh, entertainment, sometimes at the Negro League baseball games that would, that would come through. Uh, so it's kind of sad that what brought him to Roanoke was that kind of event as he was trying to make a, a living as, a, as, a, as an Olympian. What he would do, however, is every time that he would come, he would uh, challenge all of the high school athletic uh, track stars to compete with him. And, uh, and he would add the caveat that when they were running, you know, lapping the track, uh, he would jump hurdles. They wouldn't. And he would beat them. So, uh, if you're a tennis person, Freddie, uh, Frank Kovacs, Don Budge, Bobby Riggs came and did exhibition tennis matches at, at some of the uh, country clubs. Theater, live theater groups would come uh, would come through, typically kind of touring productions. And uh, so the original New York cast of Porgy and Bess came and did two two weeks at, at the Academy of Music. Uh, Ethel Barrymore came, Jeanette McDonald, uh, Bella Lugosi, Boris Karloff came and did uh, two or three plays here. And then, of course, uh, those pantheon of, of dramatic arts, the Three Stooges, came. <laughs> well, during the 1940s, of course, we have to remember that this obviously is before television, so community events had a little bit better attendance than. Uh, than than they do today. But there were often lectures uh, where leading intellectuals would be brought in and, uh, and would do uh, lectures. And so uh, W.E.B. Du Bois, Henry Sloan Coffin, Edward R. Murrow, Reinhold Niebuhr, Norman Vincent Peale, and Adam Clayton Powell. Okay. In, uh, <clears throat> in terms of civil rights, and I did an appendix in the book kind of doing a timeline of civil rights during the 1940s. And, you know, one of the things that we kind of mistakenly think is that civil rights is a 1960s thing. 
but it's very much a 1940s thing, the kind of birthing of the civil rights movement. So, <clears throat> in Roanoke, uh, we had a lady by the name of Sarah Craig, who refused to move to the back of the bus, uh, and that was in 1941, and that was a few years before Rosa Parks. <clears throat> Thurgood Marshall uh, came to Roanoke and uh, made the announcement on behalf of the Virginia NAACP that they would, as an organization, be challenging segregation uh, county by county in the Commonwealth and at the collegiate level, and their first uh, lawsuit was to be filed against the University of Virginia. We also had uh, black teachers lobbying for equal pay. They made about a third less than white teachers on average. In Roanoke, during the 1940s, <clears throat> We had the first black members of juries, we heard had the first black policemen, and we had the first black election officials. There were also legal challenges to the poll tax that were filed locally. Harry Penn was appointed to the Roanoke School Board and was the first African American to ever serve on a school board uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. We had the founding of the Hunt and Life Saving Crew <clears throat> which was the first African-American volunteer life-saving crew in the United States. In the United States. And uh, a couple years ago, we put up a historic marker over in the Gainsborough area where the old Hunton YMCA used to be. It's founded uh, in 1942. It was uh, uh, done as a result of uh, World War II. And then, in the 1940s, <clears throat> we had uh, Edward Dudley, who grew up on Gilmer Avenue. He was appointed uh, in 1947 as our nation's emissary to Liberia, and diplomatic relations between the United States and Liberia were upgraded, and President Harry Truman, who had made his appointment as an emissary, uh, retained him uh, and he then rose to the rank of ambassador, and he was the first African-American ambassador in the history of the United States. So, um, and we're working on a historic marker for him. Other events uh, that happened in Roanoke during uh, the 1940s, and Carbon's Cove came online. It was an absolutely mammoth uh, uh, infrastructure project, uh, and uh, German POWs, we had two German POW camps uh, here in Roanoke during uh, World War II. German POWs worked uh, on that, and of course, uh, it ended the little community of Carbons Cove as the city bought up uh, homes and, uh, and stores there. Uh, Woodrum Field was uh, greatly uh, expanded and then rededicated uh, as we entered the 40s. It was uh, Roanoke Airport, and then of course it got renamed, rededicated as Woodrum Field in honor of Congressman Clifton Woodrum, who had secured uh, financial support for the, uh, uh, for the funding of the expansion of the airport. We'll look at some images of the airport as it was in the early 1940s. Roanoke Star got lit on Thanksgiving Eve uh, in 1949. Uh, in 1948, the streetcar system ended in favor of buses. We had the advent of drive-in theaters. If any of you remember the Lehigh drive-in on, on Lee Highway, uh, that was the first one that opened. We had the first TV reception. We didn't have the first TV stations in, here in the 1940s, but they had the first time that television uh, was received. And, uh, and it was kind of an interesting thing. There was uh, uh, an engineer, and he was bound to determine to uh, watch television. So he went and bought a TV set down in Richmond, brought it to Roanoke, and uh, Jerry rigged the thing at his house. It didn't work. <laughs> so then he went to a second location that I can't quite remember. Jerry rigged it and it didn't work. So finally he decided, I, I, need to, I need to get elevation. And so he went on a Friday night, knocked on the door of the caretaker's house uh, up on top of Mill Mountain at Mill Mountain Park, told the caretaker and his wife what he was hoping to do. Jerry rigged it on their front porch, and uh, the boxing match from Madison Square Gardens came on. And so it was the first time television got viewed uh, in, the, in, the, in the Roanoke Valley. 
Of course, the NW produced the J-Class locomotives, uh, the Powhatan Arrow uh, debuted uh, at that time. We had the centennial of Hollins College and Roanoke College. We had the opening of Carver School in Salem. We had the onset of polio, and that'll be much more in depth in the 1950s book, which will come out uh, in the spring. But uh, Roanoke was the epicenter for treatment of uh, polio patients, polio victims, uh, really for southwestern Virginia. In fact, many of us remember, you know, Roanoke Memorial Hospital. Well, before it was Roanoke Memorial Hospital, it was Roanoke Memorial and Crippled Children's Hospital. Uh, <clears throat> we had veterans at the VA hospital that were being treated for uh, what we would know today as PTSD, but shell shock uh, coming back from the war. We had the closing of the Academy of Music. Uh, we had some interesting proposals for Mill Mountain and for Elmwood Park that didn't happen, but they'll be interesting to look at. We'll see those here in just a moment. And then, of course, we had the post-World War II boon in construction and the lifting of rationing. So during World War II, uh, no new construction could occur uh, unless it was deemed to be a, a national defense project. So all of this construction planning and all had kind of been put on hold for literally half a decade. And then once all of that got lifted, uh, a tremendous amount of things happened in downtown and elsewhere. We'll talk about that when we're looking at some of the photos. Uh, Herman Goering's uh, personal effects uh, were put on tour around the United States as a result of uh, our victory over uh, the Nazis. And that was quite a, quite a draw. Um, there were Fashion Week downtown, uh, where live models uh, would be in uh, store display windows, and there was Stag Night at the store. So it was men only, <laughs> men only at Hieronymus and places of this nature, uh, except for the models. The models were, were definitely females, and uh, so that would typically happen in November. Uh, to kind of launch the Christmas shopping season and, and, uh, and that kind of thing. Um, Lewis Johnson uh, of Roanoke was appointed as Secretary of Defense uh, under, under Harry Truman. And the last thing that I'll say, and then we'll move to some, uh, I hope, interesting pictures. Uh, when, when rationing was lifted, uh, clothing men's suits, for example, during rationing, you could not have a cuff on the suit uh, because that was considered wasted textile. Um, and on women's dresses, uh, the hemline went from kind of a, a few inches below the knee to just slightly above the knee because, again, you were wasting textile on women's dresses. So once rationing ended, uh, employers in Roanoke told their female employees, uh, we want the hemline to drop back to the, you know, two or three inches below the knee. And uh, the women uh, had a downtown Roanoke parade slash protest <laughs> because they didn't want to do that. They liked the fashion that had come out during rationing. And, of course, all their husbands and boyfriends participated in the, in the protest. Boyfriends for obvious reasons, husbands claiming that they don't want to expend money on new wardrobes. So, anyway, so we had some interesting things. All right, well, let's take a look at, um, at some photos and this kind of the fun, this kind of the fun part. All right. Well, I'll advance it this way. Let me get my glasses. This is what happens when you look at microfilm for a really, really long time. All right, Stephen, come up here and help me, brother. Wrong guy. Kelly, in the box over here. The next slide, how do we do? You didn't just hit an arrow. I had it working. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Oh, there oh, we go. What'd you do? Well, this oh, you did the up down. Oh, okay. Uh, okay, hang on a second. 
Okay. Well, wait, let's go back. Okay, so it's really like, there we go. So it's that left back and forward, back and forward. All right. Right. Well, I thought that's what I said. Oh, okay, probably. Let's see. All right, let's see. All right, so one of the things that I did in preparation for the book was I, uh, I had public scanning sessions, and by that, invited members of the public to bring in any images of the 1940s that they had. And uh, the very first one I did, and the very first guy that walked up uh, brought me uh, two photos that you're going to see. Junior Grocery was on Franklin Road, and uh, they had in their store window a huge fireworks display. And of course, uh, that was... I'm messing with you. I'm sorry. I, I got the partly working. Let me go back to that. All right. I'm just going to leave and, it. Okay. And, uh, <laughs> and so anyway, they had this huge fireworks display in their window. And the window had a little bit of crack in it with, with just a, a little piece of glass missing. And so somebody decided that was walking by, oh, no. you know what, well, just for fun, I'm going to light the firecracker closest oh, to the little opening yeah. in the window. Well, he lit the firecracker, and the whole display went up, and that was the end result. There were five people in the store. Uh, none of them, we had no fatalities, but four ended up going, uh, going to the hospital. And, uh, and so after that, then city council kind of cracked down on the whole firework kind of, kind of thing. But... Um, uh, and this is just another uh, another angle of it. But, you know, the interesting thing is you can see the crowd. Yeah. I mean, whenever there was a fire or something of this nature, I mean, hundreds of people would get in their cars and go, go, check, it, go check it out. And uh, so that's what, that's what those are. Where was Junior? On Franklin Road. It was, it was uh, not far from Lee Junior High School. In fact, all the windows that... Uh, that uh, uh, face downtown in Lee Junior High School got blown out because of the force of it. Here's an aerial view of Roanoke Airport in 1941. And uh, uh, as you can see, it says that in the large building, Roanoke Municipal Airport. Uh, and so that was terminal, hangar, all kinds of, uh, all kinds of things. But I just kind of want you to see that because you'll see here in a little while what happened to Roanoke Airport uh, in the, in, at the, towards the uh, middle of the decade. Uh, then we have uh, just some street scenes like this. This is Vinton in, uh, in the early 1940s. And folks always enjoy like looking at these photos because then they see the old storefronts and that kind of thing that, uh, uh, that, they, that they remember. Uh, in uh, October of 1941, Roanoke Municipal Airport became Woodrum Field uh, as a result of uh, its expansion and the infusion of uh, dollars into the airport. Uh, it was classified as a national defense project, so thus it did not have to comply with, with rationing. Uh, on that day, American Airlines reestablished passenger service uh, to Roanoke, and you can see the nose of the airplane there. This is one of my favorite pictures, and if any of you uh, have the Aviation in Roanoke book, this is the cover. And it's uh, because you've got military represented, you've got an airplane, you've got the terminal uh, building in the back, and uh, a, a, lot of, uh, a lot of activity. What people don't know is that uh, during the 1940s, uh, Roanoke was one of the busiest airports on the East Coast. And it is really interesting that Roanoke's airport was busier than Philadelphia, New York, and Chicago, you ready? Combined. Wow. Combined. Wow. And that was for three or four reasons. Number one, uh, it was still doing uh, cargo and passenger air service as much as could be done during the war. So it was kind of assuming the same kind of flight load as most other airports were. Secondly, we had a flight 
training, Navy cadet flight training program in Roanoke. Ground school was at Roanoke College, uh, and then the flight school was at Woodrum Field. So then you had all of these naval cadets, of course, taking off and landing uh, at Woodrum Field as well. And then the third thing that factored into that equation was that this was a way station when the military wanted to move aircraft from the East Coast to the West Coast. And so many times they would refuel at Woodrum Field and then fly uh, to, the, to the West Coast. So you had all of that military activity and then kind of the regular air activity and so it truly made Roanoke Airport one of the busiest in the world. And so sometimes, you know, somebody will cynically say, well, how did the Roanoke Airport become a national defense project? You know, Woodrow must have pulled a lot of strings. Well, Roanoke was doing more than its fair share of air traffic uh, at, that, at that time. And in 1943, and I don't remember what day in 1943, but when you ticked up all the takeoffs and all the landings, added them all up, there was one day in 1943 when the Roanoke Airport was the busiest on the planet. Oh my. On the planet. So, so hats off to the good folks. Uh, C-47 takes off from Woodrow Field this round 1946. And uh, I want to show you this picture because you can see some of the airport infrastructure uh, present in the, in the image. Uh, first of all, this is the first freestanding uh, <coughs> control tower. Here we have the terminal, and here we have the old Canaday farmhouse. Yeah. And the Canaday farmhouse served as the kind of terminal control tower <coughs> early on. And in fact, and I don't, you, you, you can, uh, there's a better picture of it in the book, but <coughs> the first control tower was actually on the roof of the Canada farmhouse. It was 12 foot by 12 foot. And uh, to get to it, to get in it, you had to go out the window, you did a little ladder up to the roof, and then you, then you, walked, you walked into the control tower. And uh, the late Wes Hillman gave me a great photo of that. Again, it's in the books, in the aviation book. But he said people did not believe it when he would tell that story that the control tower was 12 by 12 and on the uh, roof of, 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 a, of a residence. And, and, and he finally, you know, would have to whip out that photo and say, you know, here it, here it was. <clears throat> here we have uh, just one particular school of Navy uh, cadets uh, in front of a C-47 at, at Woodrum Field. Uh, the cadet training program was run by the old Penn Central Airlines. Uh, and so <clears throat> classes like this were coming through on a regular and rotating basis. So you can, it kind of gives you a flavor of truly how much activity was going on at the airport uh, during, the, during the 40s. Here we have uh, Rono native uh, Lewis Johnson uh, being sworn in as U.S. Secretary of Defense in March of uh, 1949. Many of you remember the uh, old uh, American Legion uh, Auditorium. Uh, this particular picture has it in the Roanoke Auditorium because it was later bought by the American Legion and, and then became well known as the American Legion <coughs> Auditorium after World War II. It burned in 1957. Um, and uh, if you're not familiar with where it was located, it was kind of located in what is the parking lot uh, across from the Link uh, Museum and down from the Hotel Rono, kind of sat in that area, but it was the civic center of the day. And so a lot of the stars that I rattled off, uh, their names, the big bands, and all that kind of stuff, this was the venue uh, where they where they, played, <coughs> where they performed. Uh, Thanksgiving Day game between VMI and, uh, and VPI at Victory Stadium in 1942, and of course that was a regular uh, uh, event. Uh, that happened uh, every Thanksgiving. Here is uh, an Elks Club uh, annual picnic at Rock Ledge Inn on Mill Mountain in September of, uh, of, 40, of 41. 
Here's Greer Garson at a war bond rally at Victory Stadium in 1942. Stars would come through on a regular basis. I didn't include them in the entertainment list. They only got on the entertainment list that I read to you if they entertained. Uh, but stars would come through on war bond rallies. Uh, and, uh, and so, of course, it would draw a big crowd. There'd be, you know, typically the war bond rallies were kind of under the auspices of the Chamber of Commerce or other such groups. And, uh, and so these folks would come through to encourage folks to uh, support the war through uh, the purchase of war bonds. After World War II and after the rationing got lifted, you had a, a lot of new construction, particularly downtown. So a lot of the department stores uh, expanded or renovated or remodeled, uh, which they had been kind of waiting to do for some time. And so here's the new Smartware Irving Sachs store in Roanoke in uh, April of, of 1948. And, uh, you know, if a store did this today, it would be totally in. Because it's, it's what, what goes around comes around. And so when I look at this photo, I, I, I showed it to my daughter-in-law, and, uh, and she said, ooh, ooh, where, where can I go? Where's that at? I, I need to go. And I said, well, that was in 1948. But anyway, it has that kind of sleek, modern, modern look to it. Here's an aerial view of the Hotel Roanoke, and that shows you where the American Legion uh, Auditorium uh, was. And so the, the, the Link Museum uh, passenger station is here. So that shows, that kind of uh, uh, lets you know where the, where the American Legion Auditorium was located. <coughs> then we have the Soapbox Derbies. Um, and so, <laughs> so Here's a car from uh, 1949. First Federal is the sponsor of, uh, of this one. And I'll have to say to you, the, the soapbox derbies were hugely, hugely popular. And um, uh, they were covered live uh, on radio, uh, typically by WDVJ. And, uh, and the winner would uh, compete in the national Derby, so that was always a big thing, and, 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 and he would fly, you know, out, and, and, the, and the airplane would do all this big, you know, hullabaloo when he boards, and he's off to, you know, the National <laughs> Derby. <clears throat> In the early 40s, the um, Derby was held on uh, Crystal Spring Avenue in, in South Roanoke. Now, here was the problem. First of all, if, you're, if you know Crystal Spring Avenue, it's... What better hill could you, could you do a soapbox derby on, right? But the problem was 15,000 people would show up to watch, the, to watch the races. So if your front yard was a bleacher, you, didn't, you, you got tired of that after, after a while. And so, uh, and so the soapbox derby moved uh, to 24th Street, and then it moved to a, a drag strip out in, the, out in the Starkey area. But anyway, soapbox derbies were, were hugely popular. Uh, here we have, uh, it's not a very good image, unfortunately, but Edward Dudley, uh, who grew up at uh, 405 Gilbert Avenue. In fact, his childhood home is directly next door to Oliver Hill's childhood home. Um, and again, America's first African-American ambassador, uh, 19, 1948. I don't know if any of you saw, it was probably some months ago now, but uh, PBS American Experience did a profile on uh, the three first uh, really high-ranking uh, African-American officials within the U.S. State Department. Uh, and one of the three that was profiled was Edward Dudley. And uh, so you can check that out online. I forget what the title of it is, but if you just typed in PBS American Experience Edward Dudley, you can, you can view that, that documentary online. Um, and in that documentary, Edward Dudley, uh, much of his uh, memos and conversations are, uh, are portrayed there. And the State Department had an unofficial motto, according to Dudley that all the ambassadors and all high-ranking officials within the U.S. State Department must be pale, male, and Yale. Oh. 
So he broke that. He broke that. A raw ogre. He broke that. Then you just get some cool images like this. Uh, here's the intersection of Walnut Avenue, Jefferson Street, 1948. Of course, the streetcar. Uh, they're coming, coming along. So there's a lot of these kind of just, just really neat images. Uh, here's Main Street in, uh, in Salem in the 1940s. <laughs> Got it. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, here's the lobby of the Hotel Roanoke, and, and here is the summer furniture. Yeah. Uh, the hotel in the lobby would uh, switch out its, its furniture seasonally. And so uh, wicker was brought out in the summertime, and uh, so here you see the, the Hotel Roanoke with its, with its, summer, its summer lobby uh, in 1943. The hotel in 46 would go through a massive remodel Again, following the lifting of rationing that would kind of change, not the lobby, but would change other things there at the, uh, at the hotel. Here we have the Hotel Rono Fountain Room in 1948. That was one of the things that was created as a result of kind of the remodel and expansion of the hotel following the war. Here we have looking northeast across Carbons Cove, uh, settling basin construction in, in October of, of 45. Uh, there's a, a, a wonderful lady at the Western Virginia Water Authority, and uh, she would love to have any of you come down. She has actually like created a little museum within the Water Authority uh, offices. And uh, so she has all this old stuff uh, documenting the history, equipment, and that kind of thing of uh, the water system. And uh, she has a lot of old photos of, uh, of, of, of things like this, where water infrastructure uh, and basins and that kind of thing were, were being constructed. And she tells the story that uh, uh, I asked her, I said, well, where, how, did you, how did you all get all of these photos? And she said, years ago, we had a director of the water system that looked in a closet and decided he needed better use of that closet and there were all of these photos and all of these scrapbooks and he turned to uh, somebody there and said put them in the trash and she said a custodian saw them in the trash and took them out of the trash and actually took them home and then once that guy moved on and retired, I don't know what happened. He brought him back to the water to the water department, and everybody was like, yeah. "But anyway, but she's got some stuff going all the way back to the early early 1900s when Crystal Spring was being was being constructed." But anyway, and then of course Carvin's Cove came online. Uh, uh, this is a picture on May the 20th, 1946. I think it's like three days after water went over. Uh, over the dam, and uh, and here I don't know if any of y'all know the history of the Tucker Car Company. You've seen the movie Tucker. Uh, anyway, you, you kind of know that. So here is a Tucker car on display in front of Smartware Irving Sachs store in 1948. The thing about Tucker cars was that the engine was in the trunk, and the trunk was under the front hood. It was kind of flipped. And, uh, and so we actually had a guy that was a Tucker dealer in Roanoke, and he had one car. <laughs> and what you would do is uh, his son provided me this photo, and he said, what you do is you go in and you test drive that car, and if you liked it, he would order you one. <laughs> that was not the car you got. He would order you one. And uh, that's the way it worked. So he said, we didn't have a bunch of Tucker automobiles sitting around on a, on a lot, and then, of course, Tucker uh, went bankrupt, so it didn't, didn't last too long. Uh, here's South Jefferson Street looking north. Uh, some of you might remember the Elmwood Diner. Uh, and so you can see a little bit of that sticking out uh, there in the, again, in the, in the late 40s. Here's Dr. Harry Penn, uh, who was the first African American appointed to the Roanoke School Board and, uh, and, and uh, in the Commonwealth of Virginia. He was a dentist. Um, by practice. Here is an uh, image of Jesse Owens uh, signing autographs at Carver School uh, in Salem. 
And of course, I've shared with you about what brought him here. Uh, here's the NW passenger station in the late 40s after it has gone through a, uh, a, a remodel. Here's the Hotel Roanoke in about 1940, and you can look at that image and tell what went away and what got replaced. So that whole left wing, as we're looking at this image, that goes away during the 1946 remodel. Here's the Academy of Music uh, in 1943. And um, uh, basically, the Academy of Music was closed by the fire marshal. And it was kind of a little bit piecemeal. The fire marshal, uh, there was just, he was so afraid that if a fire broke out in the Academy of Music, people could not get out. And so the first thing that happened was the upper balcony was closed, and then people could sit on the, the mid balcony and floor level. And then the mid balcony was closed, and then the whole thing was, was closed. And uh, so, anyway. It was. In fact, the, uh, uh, Bob Porterfield, the Barter Theater, uh, came to Roanoke many times, and the Barter Theater would do productions at the Academy of Music, and, and every time he would come, he would say it had the best acoustics in the state. In the state. Here's an Appalachian Power demonstration band. <laughs> and uh, so you may say, well, what is she doing, and what was the demonstration band about? Well, um, some, some ladies... Uh, we're a little leery to have uh, electric appliances uh, in the kitchen. And, uh, and so Appalachian Power decided to put minds at ease. Uh, we would have these little demonstration bags. And they would go out and they would set up in a neighborhood and they would have all kinds of kitchen gadgets that were there that ran off electricity and, uh, and demonstrate, you know, how they could be used in the, in the kitchen. And, uh, and make uh, cooking and other kinds of things uh, much, much easier. Appalachian Power actually had cooking schools. And they would bring in uh, like columnists, cooking columnists that uh, were syndicated across the country and like 800 people would show up at these Saturday morning cooking schools where her cooking skills were married with electric kitchen appliances uh, but that's what's going on in that, in that image there. Here we have the American Miss Coast Rescue Squad in the World War II Victory Parade, August the 15th, 1945. And it was kind of interesting for me to uh, learn a little bit about the Victory Parades uh, because, uh, uh, of course, uh, Germany surrenders, but there's still war against Japan. So while that was a good thing, the surrender of Germany, the war wasn't over. And, uh, but everybody kind of knew at a certain point in time it was going to be. And so the deal was in Roanoke, and really in a lot of other communities around the state, was that whenever Japan surrendered, whatever day that was, three days later the victory parade would happen. And so, uh, and so here, we have, uh, we, here we have the victory parade, or a portion of it, uh, in Roanoke. Here we have the Roanoke Star on Mill Mountain, of course, which got lit uh, Thanksgiving Eve of, uh, of 1949. And Bob Kinsey is, is uh, still with us, and I visit him on a, on a regular basis, and uh, he's, just, he's just a great guy. Uh, here's Monroe Junior High School in the late 1940s, his first school, uh, first new school that the city had built in 25 years. And again, because of rationing, they really couldn't do anything for the first half of the decade. So after, after rationing got lifted, then well, we had a lot of municipal infrastructure projects going on. Carver High School basketball championship team in 1944. There's a lot in the book about sports, uh, high school sports, uh, and the professional sports teams that, uh, that came through. Uh, here we have Dr. Downing and the Burrell Memorial Hospital staff. And uh, so there's a fair amount uh, in the book uh, relative to, to Burl Memorial Hospital and its role in the community. Here we have the Hunt and Life Saving and First Aid Crew. Now this is a picture in the 60s, and you can tell that by the, the ambulance there, but many of the men in that photo were part of the original crew 
uh, that helped to, to organize it. Here we have the remodeled interior of the NW passenger station. Uh, this picture was in uh, October of 49. Here's the Power 10 Arrow leaving Roanoke on her first run uh, in April of, of 1946. And uh, as she made her run, uh, thousands would line the track to catch the glimpse of, uh, of the Power 10 Arrow. This uh, I pulled from the NW Magazine. Because the Norfolk and Western Railway was so involved in the war effort, uh, they, they put things like this regularly in their magazine, made them posters and put them uh, in various places, uh, just reminding the workers uh, of, what, uh, of what they were, were doing and the importance of it. Uh, here's the uh, Roanoke Auditorium or the American Legion Auditorium. Treasury Secretary Harry Morgan, Henry Morgenthau is speaking uh, in 1942 again for a war bond effort. Uh, men remove soldiers' remains from an NW baggage car in 1947. Um, this was a little bit uh, of, a, of a surprise to me at how many men's remains came back to Roanoke years after the war was over. And so what would happen, they would die in battle, uh, they would be interred uh, in Europe somewhere, and then following the war there was a significant effort to bring them home. And, uh, and so uh, this was a somewhat regular occurrence as the remains of men from the Roanoke Valley were brought home for interment uh, locally. I believe that's uh, Benjamin Brown. Uh, in the, that's in the picture too. He's, uh, he was killed at Pearl Harbor. That's, the first, the, that's in the uh, casket? Yes. Mm -hmm. Thank you, John. I like this photo just because it's so like, you know. <laughs> so here we have the employees of the Crest Company lunch counter, uh, June 1949, and they're in their uniforms. And, and that kind of thing. I just kind of like pictures like that. They're, they're not like a, a historic event, per se, but it's just, it's just good stuff. Where was the press company? Uh, somebody else will have to Campbell answer that. Evans. Campbell Evans. Campbell Evans. Evans. Campbell Evans. Evans. These are often referred as Cresses. Yeah, yeah. That's the way my dad refers to it, yeah. Here's an aerial view of Elmwood Park in 1940, the home in the middle, the Elmwood home. And of course, that housed the, the library for many, 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 many years. I asked my dad jokingly, I already knew what the answer was going to be. I said, Dad, I'm sure you were in that home many times going to the library. He said, not once. <laughs> <laughs> Here's a fireman's convention parade uh, in Salem in August of, uh, in August of 40. 48, NW station at Salem in the 40s. Then War Memorial, even though this postcard's from the early 50s, uh, it went up in the 40s. And actually, Benton was the first community in Virginia to create a War Memorial. That's because everybody else was having too many committee meetings and too much discussion and too much controversy over <laughs> what they wanted to do. And Benton got it together, got their war memorial, and they were the first out of the, out of the shoot. And this tags into the story about TV reception. So here it is, ladies and gentlemen, the spot where the fights from Madison Square Gardens were first viewed. There's the caretaker's home on, on Mill Mountain. Here we have Roy Kinsey and uh, uh, actor John Payne from our area, Bob Kinsey, uh, celebrating the lighting of the star. Here's the German POW camp at Catawba uh, in 1944. And you may look at that image and, uh, and say, well, gee, that, you know, that doesn't look too bad. I mean, uh, they got a tennis court going on and that kind of thing. And that's because the German POW camp was a CCC camp before it was a POW camp. Yeah. So it already had those kind of amenities uh, to it. And, uh, uh, and the POWs helped out at Carbons Cove. The POWs uh, harvested apples and peaches at local orchardists and helped out with farm work uh, and that kind of thing. Some fell in love. And I had a lady tell me at, a, at, at one of these presentations that uh, her mom met her dad 
when he came as a POW and worked on her family's orchards, they weren't supposed to chat. Apparently they did. So he goes back to Germany, stays a few months after the war, and then he comes back. They got married, and she had an illustrious career at Salem High School as a teacher. But anyway, so, so, anyway, so there's a few little stories like that out there. Here's another image of the German POW camp uh, at Catawba in 1944. So there was one at Catawba and one on the outskirts of uh, Salem. We had two. Here's a dinner in honor of firemen uh, drafted for World War II in the upstairs of the Roanoke Firehouse, number one. Uh, here's a local blue bluegrass group posing with Roy Rogers uh, at the WDBJ studio in August of uh, 41. And then I'll show you some ads. We'll finish up. <clears throat> Drive-ins open. Uh, we had three that opened in the late 40s, the Lehigh, the North 11, and the Dixie. And so here's the ad for the opening of, uh, of the Lehigh Theater, which was the first one uh, to, uh, to do so. Uh, boxing uh, boxer Lo Joe Lewis uh, came and did an uh, uh, exhibition uh, match against uh, Bob Garner. And again, that's at uh, American Legion Auditorium. Uh, here is Dizzy Gillespie doing a Thanksgiving dance. And again, the American Legion Auditorium. Now, what I do want you to point out, at the bottom, it says white spectators. Every ad like this was white spectators or colored spectators. The deal was that if it was a black entertainer uh, doing a show and dance, uh, black patrons were floor level for show and dance. Whites could come and sit in the balcony and spectate but not go down on floor level and not dance. If a white entertainer came, it just flipped. And so uh, you would have, you, would have uh, you know, uh, that show. Uh, but that was in, in every ad. This was not just a, a Dizzy Gillespie thing. That was in every, uh, in every ad uh, where uh, the seating and the, the dancing and all was, uh, was segregated. I like the place where you buy the tickets. At usual places. At usual places. <laughs> at usual places. <laughs> we assume everybody knew, right? Yeah, there you go. At usual places. Here, uh, Louis Armstrong, and again, he's at the, uh, he's at the, and here we go. You see on this ad? Right? Here you can actually, here you actually told where you can go get your, go, 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 go get your ticket. <laughs> uh, yeah. Ella Fitzgerald, uh, Count Basie. That's right. And again, on this one, spectators. see white spectators. Um, again, white spectators, and it would be flipped if it was the other way. Here's Roy Acuff, Grand Ole Opry folks. Uh, Grand Ole Opry tended to come and perform at the Roanoke Theater, uh, not at the American Legion. And they would come through typically on a Wednesday night. Eddie Arnold. Now I'll show you the two things that were proposed but did not happen. After World War II, uh, I was decided, you know what, we need a monument, we need a memorial, we need to, you know, commemorate and uh, memorialize our war debt. So, you know, all noble, good thing. And uh, this was proposed to go on top of Mill Mountain, where the star is today. Wow. And so this, this came out in the newspaper. And the, uh, the idea was that on the floor level, when you would walk in, would actually be, uh, and you all will appreciate this, a Roanoke Valley History Museum. And so it would have artifacts and all that telling the history of, uh, of the Roanoke Valley and, and that kind of thing. 
and then you would have a, a, a searchlight tower, an observation deck uh, at, at the top. And, uh, and the uh, uh, women's club was the proponent of, of this particular uh, idea. And it kind of got well received, uh, but then other ideas began to come to the, to the fore as well. This was one of those other ideas. This was what was proposed for Elmwood Park. Oh, wow. And so, <clears throat> um, this was, uh, and I'm probably, it's going to be one or the other, but one of the two on the ends, one was to be the library, and one was to be a performing arts venue. And then the middle that looks like the Jefferson Memorial, yeah. uh, that was the War Memorial. And so when you walked in past the columns, where it was going to be inscribed all the men's names of World War I, World War II, uh, and there was a massive globe, lighted globe, proposed to even then be in the interior of that. And actually the architect of the Jefferson Memorial uh, was the one that was retained to develop this plan. So, uh, so it's kind of sometimes interesting to look at what didn't happen, uh, but what was proposed. And basically what sunk that uh, was there just was not money. Uh, city Council said, well, look, we're, we've already committed to a new library, so we'll do the library. But everything else you'll have to privately fundraise the committee that had come up with this, the War Memorial Committee. And they tried, and they just couldn't, they just couldn't cross the finish line. So that, that did not happen. All right, that's the last slide. So anyway, it gives you a little bit of a flavor of uh, visually the, the 1940s, and uh, just some kind of fun facts of, about, the, about the 1940s, a very dynamic decade for us here in the, in the Roanoke Valley. And uh, so anyway, so I, I, I hope you enjoyed the presentation. Yeah, well, we've got time uh, for a few questions. Right. Anybody want to follow up on some of the slides or some of the points you made? Sarah? <laughs> I told Sarah I'd give her the microphone and I could say that. <laughs> she, she could do it. My grandparents lived right across from Elmwood Park. Did they? So I was yeah. there now. Yeah. yeah. I remember seeing a picture later after the fire marshal, I guess, had his way with the Academy of Music, where the front of the building was just uh, totally defaced with with fire escapes and everything. Yeah. Uh, for a period of time. Yeah. I guess that was a stopgap measure. Right. Yes, sir. Hi. Um, I saw an article you did in I think it was around our Times a few six months ago or so on um, the park, which is right down the block from here which is now Patrick Henry High School, but it was mm -hmm. Shrine Hill. Yes. And being uh, a sonic, a somewhat of a scholar of Masonic stuff, I was interested in the fact that the Masonic Brotherhood was going to build a giant temple there, what? similar to these kinds of plans, of really massive. Yes. They raised a whole lot of money, yes. but didn't quite get it built. Right. And just, do you have, are there any uh, imagery or images of that? The only imagery of that was really what appeared, that was in the Roanoke Magazine. Right, okay. And it was basically a, an artistic rendering of the temple that was going to sit up on top of the of what, Shrine Hill. Right. Um, and uh, and this, was, this was in the, uh, I think the 20s or 30s, I can't quite remember. 25, I think. I yeah, I think, was the, and I think the Depression right. took a lot of steam out of that. But um, what, what he's talking about is uh, in the 20s, uh, uh, the, uh, uh, the Shriners Masons wanted to create kind of a retreat center uh, in where Patrick Henry High School is today. And so there was going to be a Masonic temple up on the knoll, and it was going to be a lodge with kind of like a hotel with, with rooms and meeting spaces, performance venues, 18-hole golf course, swimming pool, tennis courts. But it was it was massive in its scale, and uh, uh, did a lot of fundraising and and that kind of thing. But again, just didn't cross the finish line. And so, uh, where the uh, uh, Masons are at today, down on uh, on Campbell Avenue, the city did a land swap and some cash, and so they built their new high school 
on land that the Shriners held and said, well, we'll give you land that we hold. And so they did a land swap and some money and that kind of thing. And so Patrick Henry High School went up rather than us uh, looking at this really grand kind of wow. retreat, retreat center. Yeah. yeah. So again, that was something that didn't happen. But it's fascinating to think about all the effort and discussion that at that time that was trying to make it happen. That's a yeah. big lot of land that they own. Yeah. 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 You mentioned the uh, special sale for the men on Christmas Eve. Yeah. The, the shoot lived across the street from us. And she was a nurse one time that was scale. And she said, on the day after Christmas, it took all that lingerie back to Miller Roads. Cancer Men Camp was one of them all. I got. <laughs> oh gosh, yeah, the stag nights, they were well publicized. Oh my goodness. Gosh, gosh. That continued up to the early 60s. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, yeah, interesting. Well, again, just a, a quick plug. The books are available. It's $40 tonight, only tonight, <laughs> all of it to the Historical Society for, 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 for our Historical Society. And well, thank, thank you, you all thank so much. You. Thank you.